Hi everyone, it's Ruth here again, and today I have my friend Taylor with me. So Taylor's just going to introduce herself a little bit. Hi boys and girls. Hi Ruth. Hello. So as you know, my name is Taylor and I am from Nina and I am a teacher. So Ruth and boys and girls, as we all know, our schools have been closed since mm -hmm. March. And I know a lot of you who are watching this video were probably due to make the sacrament of confirmation and maybe your confirmation date has been postponed. Now, maybe we didn't get the opportunity to learn about the sacrament of confirmation mm -hmm. and what it means in your life. So before we start, let's say a prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father, and, and of the Son, Son and, and of the, the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of, and of the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Ruth, we just blessed ourselves before and after we said our prayer mm -hmm. and we made the sign of the cross. Mm -hmm. And as we know, it represents the Trinity, God the Father, the Father, the, the Son, Son, and, and the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Oh, yeah. Now, if I were to ask you, what do you know about God the Father? God the Father, uh, he created everything. He created heaven and earth and he created all the animals and the trees and the plants and he created us. Absolutely. Most importantly, boys and girls, God created humans just like you and us. Mm -hmm. So that's the first person of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. The second person we have, God the? The Son. The Son who is? Jesus. Absolutely. So what do we know about Jesus? So we know a lot about Jesus. Um, so from when the angel Gabriel came to Mary at the Annunciation and then when he was born at Bethlehem. And we don't hear much about him when he was a child, except for that one time that he got lost in That's the temple. Right. Um, and then we hear a lot about him from when, the three years when he was doing his ministry. So he was talking with his disciples and the apostles and telling them that he was God and how much he loved them. And then we know that he was crucified and died and was resurrected again and ascended into heaven. Wow, Ruth, you know a lot about Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third person is the Holy, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now I'm sure the boys and girls know that the Holy Spirit plays a really important part in their confirmation day. Mm -hmm. But who is the Holy Spirit? Oh, uh, I don't actually know that much about the Holy Spirit. Well, Ruth, we're going to actually read a passage now from the Acts of the Apostles in the Bible, and it might help you to learn a little bit more about the Holy Spirit. Okay, great. When the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as of fire, which parted and came to rest on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven staying in Jerusalem. At this sound, they gathered in a large crowd, but they were confused because each one heard them speaking in his own native language. Imagine that, Ruth. That's amazing. Can you believe it? Wow. So there were all these people in Jerusalem at that time, people from lots of different countries. Mm. And when the apostles came out on the streets to them, they were each able to hear the apostles speaking in their native languages. Oh my goodness. And it wasn't like the apostles were really educated and knew how to speak all those languages because they were just ordinary men from Galilee. Absolutely. They didn't have time to do studying, to study all these different languages. Mm -hmm. But yet when the spirit became, came upon them, they, were, they received this gift. Wow. They were all astounded and bewildered and said to one another, what does this mean? But others said, scoffing, they have had too much new wine. Oh, can you imagine that, Ruth? <laughs> oh my goodness. They thought the apostles were drunk and that's how they were able to speak uh, or to hear in, them in, these, in their different languages. Wow. The apostles must have been just so joyful and happy if you know, people thought they were drunk. <laughs> and that's exactly what they were. Mm. But you see, before that had happened and when they were sitting in the upper room, they were terrified, they were sat in the room all huddled together and suddenly the windows burst open mm. and there was this really loud wind filled the room. 
Have you ever heard like really loud winds before? Yeah, we've had a few storms actually, and I remember some of them were so, so loud. That's right, Ruth. Sometimes when we hear these loud winds, they make us feel uncomfortable and afraid. But the apostles, once the wind came into the room, it brought with it this fire. And as the fire came in, it broke into tongues of fire and each rested on one of the apostles. Wow, so what exactly happened to the apostles after they received the Holy Spirit? Well, Richard, my friend, is actually coming along and he's going to fill you in on what happened to them. Oh, wow, brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Taylor. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Welcome, Richard. Um, so, boys and girls, this is Richard, and he's going to talk to us a little bit more about Pentecost and about what happened to the apostles to, to make them go from being so scared in the upper room to being so courageous and talking about Jesus. Thanks, Ruth. Uh, so, boys and girls, as Ruth said there, I'm going to focus really now, start off on the courage of the apostles in going out and preaching Jesus to to everyone that they met in the streets that day of Pentecost. So as you said their Ruth, I mean, these were a group of men who were really fearful for their lives. Uh, and something extraordinary must have happened in order for them then to be changed so fundamentally that they would go out and then preach about Jesus to all these people that they had never even met before. Yeah, and why exactly were they so scared? Well, I suppose if you go back 50 days, uh, Roos, then we have Easter Sunday. And so on Easter Sunday, Jesus had risen from the dead. Now he rose from the dead because on Good Friday, he was crucified. Mm -hmm. The reason he was crucified is that he was teaching people about God and he told people that he was the son of God, that he actually is God himself, God made man. Mm -hmm. And this was not a message that people wanted to hear. The Jewish people of the time brought him then to the governor of Jerusalem who was Pontius Pilate and he set him off to be tortured and to be crucified for saying that he was the son of God. So I mean you can imagine if you the person that you've been following who you believe is the son of God then is taken off and tortured and crucified that would scare you to to the very depths of your soul. So they must have thought that if they kept talking about Jesus the same thing would happen to them. That's it exactly yeah. yeah and so therefore I think that something extraordinary happened to compel them to go out and to preach Jesus to the world. So that's then what happened with the Holy Spirit. God himself came down upon them and gave them that great courage. And we know that they had great courage because 3,000 people were converted that first day. Wow. So that's, that's really extraordinary, oh you know? Oh my goodness. Uh, and so then, Ruth, I know that we were talking earlier a little bit about the, the fear of the apostles and how St. Peter then himself was was put into jail for for preaching that message yeah. and how uh you were saying to me a little bit about how yeah, he so he was set free from jail yeah he was set free by an angel but then like he was just after being put in jail for preaching to the jews who had killed jesus that jesus was god he was put in jail and he was set free and then where did he go but right back to the exact same place to preach to those same jews about jesus again like that is crazy courageous <laughs> i know well exactly well clearly he's not fearing for being put in prison again no. and i mean they had such faith that all the apostles except for the apostle john actually all died for their faith and so i mean you know if someone believes in something if they're willing to die for it mm -hmm. so clearly these men believed so much in christ that jesus rose from the days that they were willing to be put into jail and to be to be killed themselves for it so i mean it's quite it's quite an unbelievable courage and uh quite an unbelievable sense of being filled with the holy spirit that they has mm. yeah it's almost like daniel in the lesson we were doing earlier like daniel was so courageous as well and so believed in god that he was willing to be put in jail too that's it exactly and the remarkable thing then is that the holy spirit who came down upon the apostles on pentecost sunday came down upon us in our confirmation day and it's going to come down upon you in your confirmation day as well wow. it's the same holy spirit because god is unchanging and so that passion that they were filled with we too can be filled, filled with that passion if we prepare properly for our confirmation day uh, and really are receptive to receiving god and the holy spirit well it sounds quite remarkable but that's what we can be filled with if we nurture our relationship with god and are, receive, are receptive to, uh, to the Holy Spirit on Confirmation Day, then we can be filled with that great courage and that great passion. Wow. And I think that's exactly what we need at the moment in our culture, in our world, mm -hmm. uh, Ruth, because we're living in a world where we receive very mixed mes messages yeah. about God. 
Uh, some people saying that that they don't believe in God. Some people that we might know might not be going to mass at the weekend, uh, might not be praying every day. And so we then need to have that courage to say, you know, God is real. Jesus is real. Jesus rose from the dead. And we can know this with certainty. Uh, we can know this with certainty from the teachings of the Catholic Church, which is really quite fascinating. And we're, we're filled then with this conviction by the Holy Spirit coming down upon us on our confirmation day. And so we need to bring that love of God then to other people in our lives. Wow, and how exactly do we do that then? Well, the way we like, the way to do it, I think is first of all, you have to nurture your own relationship with God in prayer. Okay. So you have to pray every day. And what exactly, sometimes, I, you know, I was told that you have to pray every day as a child when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I suppose I was saying, uh, saying my prayers every day, but I didn't actually get what they meant by that. And so recently I heard what prayer actually means. It means having a conversation with God and so in a conversation route like what we're having now there's both speaking and there's listening and so that's what is involved in prayer every day with god so we need to have that personal relationship with jesus because you know that's exactly what the heart of our catholic faith is it's that personal relationship with jesus even before we talk about things like what we should or shouldn't do and that's the very heart of it so we need to nurture that relationship and then share with others say this is what makes me happiest in life knowing jesus learning about his love for me and maybe you know recommending things like uh, reading the gospels or inviting someone along to to come with you to mass at the weekend mm. they're great ways of sharing the faith okay at our confirmation route we can become soldiers for christ <gasps> that is so cool i want to be a soldier for christ i know wait wait does that mean we get to do like karate and taekwondo and stuff like that <laughs> well, no it's not quite that uh route although i love that that passion because that passion is exactly what we need to bring to our face and sharing god with the world mm. it is i know it's a really great image i think it's really it's really relevant to our world at the moment mm. because as we say we're receiving all these mixed messages from the world about god about the purpose of our lives and so we therefore need to be strong like a soldier going out into a battle because that's what life is it's a battle for souls and god says to us i want you to win as many souls as possible for me i want you to bring as many people to me in heaven as possible because it says in the bible that god wills all people to be saved he wants everyone to be saved me you our families our friends the whole world wow. and so that's what we're called to do then as soldiers for christ to share our faith and to call others to that relationship with god mm. And so I know we were talking earlier then, Ruth, about the, the different ways of imagining how we can be soldiers for Christ. Uh -huh. So imagine what a soldier actually looks like. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about putting on a helmet as a person going into battle. And so that's like putting on the mind of Christ. So not just living for ourselves, mm -hmm. but saying, God, what do you want for me? What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. So like in a situation, if I, if I have to put on my helmet as the mind of Christ, is that like me thinking, okay, so what would Jesus do right now? That's instead it, exactly. Of what do I want to do? Exactly, okay. yeah, that's it. And I think that's a really great thing to know. Uh, and it's a really great thing to always keep to the forefront of our mind. What does God want me to do? Yeah. Uh, and as well as that then, in our armor that we would wear, you need to wear an armor in a battle to, mm -hmm. to defend you in case you get hit. And so I suppose getting hit would be receiving a, a, an incorrect message from the world, maybe mm -hmm. through a movie you've been watching, or maybe through music perhaps. Uh, or maybe through a TV show, which is, is giving a message that's confusing you about God's love, mm. uh, maybe about the best way to live. Mm. And so you need that spirit, that you need that protection then uh, in order to be out in, in that battle for souls. And, and what is that armor then exactly? Well, the way I like to think of it, uh, Ruth, is that that's your prayer life. So making time, we just talked about prayer. You need to make that time for prayer every day. Quiet time with God, emptying out yourself and your worries and filling yourself up with God's love and God's mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. And so after that prayer life then, which is really at the heart of our face, we need to have a shield then to protect us as well yeah. against attacks from, from uh, our world, which are misleading us, which are leading us away from God. And so I like to think about our shield being the teachings of the Catholic Church. So mm -hmm. I know we were talking earlier about where exactly do you find those teachings? Mm -hmm. and I know you were telling me a little bit about us. Yeah, so, um there's this thing called the Catechism, and it's just a big giant book which has all the answers of what the church teaches and why it does what it does, why it teaches what it teaches, but it's way too long for me. So I love this one, and it's called the UCAT. And so basically it's a catechism for young people. And it's great because it has loads of questions that we might ask about, you know, why do we do certain things? Why do we go to Mass on a Sunday maybe? 
and um, all these different things and it has all the answers for it right in here and um, so it's really amazing yeah and what i really like is when you have a question then about what exactly does does god teach us about this what does the church teach us you can just go to that yeah. because that's something that i was really confused about myself when you're getting messages maybe your friends are telling you to go along and do something that you know isn't right and you say well, how do i know that isn't right well if you go to the catechism then you'll find your answer there it'll, it'll guide you uh, god himself will guide you along the right path yeah. uh, and then moving on from the shield then i suppose the last one i'm going to end on is the sword then such a powerful image you know mm. of going out into the world uh, and so i like to imagine the sword being the bible the word of god and so we need to know what what god's word is uh how he speaks to us in the bible and we know the heart of the bible is the gospels mm-hmm. uh and so a little piece every day Ruth, i think is enough to keep you in touch with god so you don't have to read don't set yourself the whole task of reading the whole bible but focus on the gospels and reading just a couple of lines every day mm-hmm. really allows god to speak to you and allows you to cut through the lies that you might be receiving from the world which are leading you away from God. Wow, so just that like reading one little bit of the Gospels every day turns into our sword. Exactly, and it keeps it good and sharp as well so you can really cut through those those misleading messages in our our world and in our culture. Uh, And so then when we're we're called to be soldiers for Christ, Mm -hmm. Ruth, I like to to imagine uh, on Pentecost that when we think of the courage of those those apostles going out Mm -hmm. as soldiers, then I like to think of the image of the fire, that the tongues of fire down upon the heads of the apostles, because I think that's a really good, strong, passionate image. Mm-hmm. And so the tongues of fire then, they represent two things in particular. Mm-hmm. So when you think of fire root, what yeah. are the two main things that you think of? Um, let me think. Well, fire is, it's very bright. Yeah, so exactly. So like light. Yes, light, yeah. And well, it's really warm, great for toasting marshmallows. <laughs> So heat? Exactly, yeah, that's okay. it. Uh, so it's light and heat are the two main properties of fire. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on now. So light signifies truth. Well, that reminds me of a song. It's like that marching song that we do. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching in the light of God. We are marching. and heat signifies love. Mm. And so that's exactly what God is. God is perfect truth and perfect love. Okay, wow. And so I suppose that's exactly what we're searching for in life. We're searching for that perfect love, that perfect truth. Mm. And actually, boys and girls, just to teach you a small bit about what exactly the human person is, we're made up of two parts. We're made up of our bodies and our bodies need nourishments but we're also made up of our souls, our spiritual selves. And so our spiritual selves then need the nourishment of God himself because God is truth and God is love. And so that's what our souls are searching for the whole time. They want that nourishment of truth and love. Wow, so so when you say God is love, you're not just saying that he's somebody who loves me, like he's love itself. So anytime that we're loved by anyone, God is present there. Exactly, that's yeah, that God is working through them. And it's the same when we come across a true message in life. That's God working through people in the world mm. or through, let's say, things like the catechism to bring him, himself and bring his truth to us. Yeah. Uh, and so then I suppose if you think about, it's useful to think, boys and girls, about examples of real people in life then to help us to understand this. Mm. So there's a great saint called Saint Augustine who lived 1600 years ago. I know that seems like a an amazing amount of time ago to us but what i really like about what he says is that what he says about 1600 years ago in his life is true for us today and so saint augustine saint augustine was a person who liked to live a party lifestyle he liked to go out to the best university he was trying different religions he liked going out partying with his friends but none of that ever satisfies him and i think that's sometimes what we're led into believing in our in our world as well that money or pleasure or power or honor that these things are really going to make us happy Mm. whereas saint augustine learned 
that these aren't what truly make you happy. He has a great quote, he says, that our hearts are restless, Lars, until they rest in thee. And so it's only by finding God, by putting God at the center of our lives, that we truly find that peace and that true happiness. Wow, so I wish more people knew that because I know so many people who think that if they were just richer or maybe famous or something, that then they would be happy. But like you're just saying that, no, it's none of that. It's just God who can make us like fully at peace and fully happy. That's it, exactly. And you know, another one of my favorite saints is Saint Mother Teresa, that great saint who served the poor and served God in the streets mm -hmm. in India for so many years. And so what she says is that the deepest needs of the human heart is to be loved. And that's exactly what God gives us, that perfect love of God, as we said, that we can know from Jesus dying on the cross for us because there's no more perfect love than that than to give up your life for your friends. So God loves us with that perfect love and that's what Mother Teresa says. That's what we need to share with the world. That's what we need to do in our world at the moment. So it's only God's love really that can fulfill us. So anytime like, you know, we might feel anxious or worried or all these things, the only thing that can actually bring us peace is God's love. That's it, exactly. Uh, and I'm just gonna end up, Ruth, by giving us two different ways of looking at the world as as presented by two different people. Okay. So the first person is going to be Stephen Hawking. So he was a really great scientist uh, in the last century who, who did great things in the scientific field. But he was an atheist. He was someone who didn't believe in God. And so that then led into the way he thought about us as humans. He said that we are chemical scum on a moderately sized planet. He believed that we had no ultimate meaning and that there was no ultimate purpose to our lives. That's so sad. It really is, you know. Uh, I mean, you can imagine we talked about light and heat and the way Christ lights up our life and he brings that warmth to our life. And so, I mean, if you don't have Christ and don't have God in your life, it just makes me feel like the light is extinguished yeah. and that you're left feeling cold and lonely. Mm -hmm. And so then we contrast then that to the teaching of the Catholic Church and that's put across by a person called Pope Benedict XVI. So he was the Pope before Pope Francis and I really love what he says about life. He says that each person is creating God's image and likeness, that we are willed by God. We're not a random, meaningless product of evolution. Mm. It's not as if this just happened by accident, but rather that God wanted each one of us to live, that he has a purpose for us, and that he's saying that you listening at home have infinite value, that God has a great purpose for your life, and that God loves you so much that he wants to be with you forever in heaven. Because that's exactly what our purpose is in life, isn't it, yeah. Ruth? That we're here to actually get to heaven. Get to heaven, wow. And it's just amazing to put that together then with what you were saying earlier about God loves us so much that he died on the cross. That like God wants us to be with him so, so much that it wasn't enough that he would create us, but he also died for us because he doesn't want to be in heaven without each and every one of us, which is just mind blowing how much he loves us. Exactly, and that's what gives us the great hope in life. And it's mm -hmm. what, you know, when I, when, I'm, when I think about that, when I pray about that, you know, as he says, that's what gives me my peace. And that's what mm -hmm. gives me my happiness in life. Yeah, wow. Well, thank you so much, Richard. That was amazing. And we hope you enjoyed, boys and girls. God bless you all. Thanks, Ruth. God bless. Bye.